Hello historians and welcome back. Today we will be looking at the later reign of Queen Elizabeth I. In the last video we covered the execution of fellow Queen Mary Queen of Scots. Mary had been involved with the Babington plot, which planned to kill Elizabeth and replace her with the former Scottish Queen. As a result, Elizabeth accidentally signed her cousin's death warrant and the Scottish Queen was executed at Fotheringhay Castle. Elizabeth wrote to Mary's son, King James VI for Scotland, and told him, I'm sorry. He was fine. But the Spanish, not so much. And we're going to be looking at some of the consequences of Elizabeth beheading Mary, Queen of Scots. As it turned out, the consequences weren't as serious as Elizabeth had feared. The English Catholics pled loyalty to Elizabeth, Scotland, as briefly mentioned earlier, didn't really care, as now King James VI was now Elizabeth's potential heir. France still wanted an alliance with England, as they were scared of the mighty Spain, and Spain was already warring with England over the pirating and the Dutch revolt, so her death had very little effect. What it did do, though, was give King Philip II of Spain a reason to attack England. In July 1588, Elizabeth knew that the Spanish Armada was coming. Philip had been plotting against England for years. His first plan of trying to marry Elizabeth failed. His plan of trying to replace Elizabeth with Mary Queen of Scots had failed. And Sir Francis Drake and the other English sea captains were rubbing salt in his wounds by stealing his treasure. He also believed that he needed to help free the English Catholics but the English Catholics didn't want a Spanish king ruling them any more than the Protestants did. People still remembered the terrible days when Philip had been married to Mary. It was Philip that had encouraged the burnings, not Mary. Now Mary, Queen of Scots, had been executed, he had a cast-iron excuse to march in, dispose Elizabeth, and avenge her death. He planned to send an armada, which is Spanish for large fleet, you're welcome to put the English navy out of action, so that the Spanish troops could cross the Netherlands in other, smaller ships and conquer England. Philip had planned the Armada for two years, and it pained him that Elizabeth was on the throne without him as consort. Not saying that he was in love with Elizabeth, but if she was on the throne, then realistically, if his first plan had worked, he would be ruling it too? And that's what he wanted, the kingdom, not Elizabeth. Philip at this point was 61 and Elizabeth was in her 50s. Soon after departing from Lisbon, Spanish ships had been damaged. Men had diseases and food had gone rotten, all before leaving. They had to stop at Corona in northern Spain for repairs. The commander of the fleet wrote to Philip telling him what had happened and that the men are weak. But Philip wanted the attack to go ahead as planned. They planned on sailing up the channel, meeting with a Netherlands force led by the Duke of Parma in Dunkirk, who were to be ferried across in barges to invade Kent. The Armada would protect that fleet as they went on to England. It is claimed that Sir Francis Drake stood on Plymouth Hoe playing a game of bowls, and when he was interrupted to be informed about the arrival of the Spanish fleet, he said, Time enough to play the game, and thrash the Spaniards afterwards. And he was determined to finish his game of bowls before dealing with the Armada. However, this is a lie. He did not play bowls at the arrival of the Armada. All accounts of Drake playing the game were written years after the event. You sit on a throne of lies. Meanwhile, English troops had been gathering at Tilbury in case the Duke of Parma landed from the Netherlands. Elizabeth decided that she would go and meet the men who were going to defend their country. Not everyone thought she should go. They were worried about her safety. What if a Catholic was among the troops? Would they take a shot at her? Elizabeth had long since forgiven Robert Dudley for his marriage to Latisse, and he was now in command of the troops at Tilbury. That was the real reason she was going. The Spaniards now had to make it up the channel. Some of their ships crashed into each other, and an explosion lost them two ships. The navy intercepted the armada in the channel, 
and Drake took one of the Spanish ships, the Rosario. While at Tilbury, Elizabeth made an infamous speech that would inspire the English for centuries. And it's even used by our lionesses. The story of the Armada and Elizabeth's speech at Tilbury is used to inspire our little island in times of need. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England too, and think it foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare invade the borders of my realm, to which rather than any dishonour shall grow by me, I myself will take up arms, I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarded of every one of your virtues. That last bit meant that she would pay the troops. As far as monarchs go, Elizabeth had a better record than many rulers on this. But she didn't pay them, despite saying she would in her speech. In the original story, the Queen's speech starts off the attack. The English set fire to eight ships of their own and launch them towards the Armada. In a panic, they cut rank and some ships collided. Then the wind drove the ships northward and then sailed. But... Yeah, Elizabeth actually made her speech 11 days after the fire ships and after the Armada had been won. The men also were sent home as the Queen couldn't afford to pay their wages. They never actually got a chance to fight as the bad weather destroyed most of the Armada and the Spanish retreated. Elizabeth had come up with the plan to address the troops with her infamous speech while the Spanish were still in the Channel. Yet by the time she arrived at Tilbury, the Armada were already staring defeat in the face. Eleven days earlier, English fire ships had attacked the Spanish fleet while it was waiting off France for its rendezvous with Palmer's army. These burning vessels caused the Spanish to panic. So, when Elizabeth uttered her famous words at Tilbury, what was left of the Armada was on its way home, running up around Scotland and Ireland to get back to Spain, so basically just doing a loop of the uh, UK to turn round. The sources don't even mention the famous heart and stomach of a king line until more than three decades after the event. It was first introduced by a Protestant chaplain who had been at Tilbury. Although it does kind of sound like something that Elizabeth would say, gales prevented the capture of the Spanish ships, which were driven north and they limped home round the north of Scotland. Many ships were wrecked, hundreds of Spaniards drowned, and only half the Armada returns to Spain. Not a single English ship had been lost or taken. So, basically, we beat the Spanish because of bad weather. Sounds about right. Despite beating the Armada, Elizabeth's ongoing struggle against Spain was costly and unsuccessful, leaving a large debt to her successor. The crown threatened prison for those who were bold enough to claim that they had not been paid. By the end of 1588, more than half of the men who had fought against the Armada had died from disease and starvation. The Spanish Armada is often depicted as this invincible navy, but it was tiny, really. There was 103 Spanish ships versus 34 English ships, Elizabeth and some private ships for extra. The Norman invasion fleet of 1066 and the French force that crossed the Channel and sunk the Mary Rose in 1545, had more ships than the Armada. Here in England, we see the Armada story as a great underdog story, a victory against the evil Spain. But the Spanish never really saw the Armada as a significant setback. Elizabeth was too poor to pay those who had fought for their country, and the English Admiral Lord Howard wrote, The sailors cry out for money, and know not when they are paid. I have given them my word and honour that I will see them paid. If I had not done so, they would have run away from Plymouth in their thousands. So what were the consequences of the Spanish Armada? Well, the defeat did not harm Philip's control over his empire, which continued to grow after his death in 1598, and Spain would remain a dominant superpower for a further hundred years. Philip tried other armadas in 1596 and 15... 
97, but both of them, again, were destroyed by bad weather, although I guess more specifically this time storms. England took it as a sign that God was on their side, even celebrating a national day of thanksgiving for its victory over Spain on the 24th of November. Elizabeth's reputation as Gloriana peaked. The Armada also meant that England was able to continue causing trouble for the Spanish Empire, and the pirates continued to attack Spanish treasure ships. On the 4th of September 1588, the Queen's favourite and one true love, Robert Dudley, died at Cornbury Park near Oxford. Dudley's health had not been good for some time. Historians have considered malaria and stomach cancer as causes of death, but his death still came unexpectedly. Elizabeth, unsurprisingly, was deeply affected and locked herself in her apartments for a few days and refused to speak to anyone until Lord Burley had the door broken. Elizabeth kept the letter he had sent her six days before his death in a bedside treasure box for the rest of her life. It was marked with his last letter in Elizabeth's handwriting. However, don't think for one minute that in her grief, Elizabeth would be kinder to her cousin Latisse. No! Her grief did not make her any more sympathetic to poor Latisse, Robert Dudley's widow. Dudley had died owing the Queen a loss of money and Elizabeth wanted it back. She made Latisse auction her furniture to pay the debt, as well as taking back a house that she had given Robert. All this, despite the fact that Dudley had left Elizabeth a spectacular necklace of 600 pearls to add to her vast collection of jewels, Elizabeth wore Dudley's necklace for the portrait that was painted to celebrate the English victory over the Armada. Elizabeth was more popular than ever after the Armada and she had finally earned the respect of her own counsellors. Lord Burley declared, She is the wisest woman that ever was, for she understands the interests and dispositions of all the princes in her time and is so perfect in the knowledge of her own realm that no counsellor she has can tell her anything she does not know before. Even the new Pope was a fan. She is a great queen and were she only a Catholic, she would be our dearly beloved daughter. Just look how well she governs. She is only a woman, only mistress of half an island. Rude. And yet she makes herself feared by Spain, by France, by the Empire, by all. I wish I was free to marry her. What children we would have. They would have ruled the world. All right, Pope, calm down. In the November, Elizabeth was still milking the success of the Armada, which had happened in the July, and held a victory parade through London. England and Elizabeth had an inflated ego, so we launched the Counter Armada, also known as the English Armada, real original, in May 1589. Now, I'm going to give my English viewers a heads up, as you know we don't like discussing battles that we lost. So, if you're English, I suggest skipping this section so you don't get triggered or end up having a stroke because you've learnt that we've actually did lose a battle. Sir Francis Drake led the counter-attack on Spain with the hopes of finishing the original Spanish Armada once and for all, and to invade Portugal, which was under Spanish rule, and put a Portuguese king on the throne. But the counter-armada failed. The counter-armada suffered twice as much as the Spanish did in the original Armada. The victory of the Counter Armada was not as important to Philip as the victory of the original Armada was to England. The defeat of the Counter Armada was downplayed. A defeat our history wants to forget. Drake and his fleet were forced into making a stop at Corona for lack of provisions. A local woman, Maria Pitta, led a fierce resistance against the English navy. Still celebrated as a heroine in Corona, Pitta is said to have killed an English soldier herself, thereby inspiring the town to victory. 15,000 Englishmen and many of the 86 ships were lost. Elizabeth was getting old now, by Tudor standards anyway, and having witnessed the death of Robert Dudley in 1588, she would see the deaths of two other people that were close to her. The next one would be Blanche Perry, Elizabeth's royal servant right from the time Elizabeth was a child. 
she died blind on the 12th of February 1590, and the next death was on the 6th of April 1590. Elizabeth's spymaster, Sir Francis Walsingham, died. Walsingham had engineered the downfall of Mary Queen of Scots by providing evidence of her treason against Elizabeth. William Cecil, Lord Burley, was also getting on too. He wanted to retire, but Elizabeth wouldn't allow it. But she did allow him to sit down on a stool in her presence. Usually everyone had to stand or kneel when she was in the room. Although I was watching History After Dark the other day, and they were talking about Queen Elizabeth I. And I really like what Dr. Katrina Marchant said. And she's also got a YouTube channel called Reading the Past, which I highly recommend to anybody that loves history. Like, Dr. Kat's videos are chef's kiss. Like, I, I love her. I think she's really funny. And I really respect her work on YouTube as well. So please go support her. Go subscribe. Go watch her videos. But anyway, on History After Dark, she said <laughs> that Elizabeth preferred to work her council to death rather than execute them, which I thought was quite funny because actually she's got a fair point there. <laughs> oh, it's funny because it's true. Point in case, Lord Burley. Elizabeth had banned her godson, Sir John Harrington, from court in 1585 for disgracing himself by making rude remarks to her ladies-in-waiting. However, he managed to win back her favour in 1591 by inventing a flushing toilet, which he called an Ajax. Elizabeth travelled to Kelston Hall to try his Ajax and loved it so much she invited him back to London to install his invention in all of her palaces. As a result, Queen Elizabeth I was the first monarch in current Britain to have a flushing toilet. However, it would be another 200 years before the idea caught on. Prior to this, Tudor palaces and great houses had little rooms called jakes. Sorry to any viewers called jake. The waste from the jakes weren't washed away, but instead fell into a pit. With hundreds of people living in a palace, these pits soon filled up. It was actually pretty disgusting. The pits had to be opened. They were then shoveled up and carted away. The smell would hang around for weeks. That's why Tudor monarchs had three or four palaces that they could move around to. Tudors used a communal damp rag for toilet paper as it could be rinsed and reused. Gross. As always, I am presenting you highbrow history. On the 28th of January 1596, Sir Francis Drake lay dying. The West Indies legend has it that he ordered his magical drum back to England and swore he would return to his homeland. The drum was taken back to Plymouth, where it remains today, and the drum beats out its own warning when the country is in trouble. The drum is said to have rattled when Napoleon Bonaparte was brought to Plymouth after the Battle of Waterloo. It also sounded in 1914 when World War I started. The last time the drum sounded was during the Battle of Dunkirk in World War II. If you would like a video on Sir Francis Drake and his drum, then let me know in the comment section down below. On the 4th of August 1598, Elizabeth had finally worked her senior advisor, William Cecil, to death, and he passes his political mantle to his son. Robert Cecil. Robert Dudley at this point had been dead for several years and the Queen was in need of a new favourite. Enter Robert Devereux. Hello there. Dudley's stepson and Letice's son from her first marriage. In 1599, Robert Devereux was a bit of a scoundrel during a period of war, the Nine Years' War to be exact. He failed to defeat his Queen's Irish enemies and would instead make peace without her consent. And he went about knighting people, something he had no right nor power to do. The cheek, the nerve, the gall, the audacity and the gumption. This rightfully enraged Elizabeth. Robert Devereux was also the Earl of Essex and his greatest failure as Lord Lieutenant. Lord Lieutenant is the same as Lieutenant for the American viewers. It's spelled exactly the same, but it's just pronounced as lieutenant. I think lieutenant makes sense, and that's probably one of the few times I'll actually agree that the American way of doing it is probably better. But 
he was Lord Lieutenant, so when I say that, that's what I mean. Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex's greatest failure as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, a post which he talked himself into in 1599, was the Nine Years' War. The Nine Years' War was in its middle stages and no English commander had been successful. More military force was required to defeat the Irish chieftains, led by Hugh O'Neill, the Earl of Tyrone, and supplied from Spain and Scotland. Lieutenant Devereux led the largest expeditionary force ever sent to Ireland, 16,000 troops, with orders to put an end to the rebellion. He departed London to the cheers of the Queen's subjects, and it was expected the rebellion would be crushed instantly. But the limits of the Crown's resources and of the Irish campaigning season dictated otherwise. Essex had declared to the Privy Council that he would confront O'Neill in Ulster. Instead, he led his army into southern Ireland, where he fought a series of inconclusive engagements, wasted his money, and dispersed his army into garrisons, while the Irish won two important battles in other parts of the country. Rather than face O'Neill in battle, Essex entered a truce that some considered humiliating to the crown and to the detriment of English authority. The Queen herself told Robert that if she had wished to abandon Ireland, it would scarcely have been necessary to send him there. Ooh, burn! In all of his campaigns, Robert Devereux secured the loyalty of his officers by conferring knighthoods. An honour the Queen herself dispensed sparingly, and by the end of his time in Ireland, more than half the knights in England owed their rank to him. The rebels were said to have joked that he never drew sword but to make knights. But his practice of conferring knighthoods could in time enable Essex to challenge the powerful factions of Cecil's command. Robert Devereux had none of the charisma, uniqueness, nerve or talent that his stepfather Robert Dudley did. Nor did he apparently have the brain cells. In September 1599, Robert Devereux burst in on the Queen while she was getting dressed. A breach of protocol and privacy. As Elizabeth got older, it took her four hours a day to get dressed and undressed, so that's two hours on, two hours off. She wore wigs throughout to cover up her ageing face, and she wore white, lead, peruse and vinegar on her face, neck and hands. Beeswax and plant dye paste on her lips and her eyes were lined with coal. The young, pretty Elizabeth had aged into a balding, frail woman with black, rotten and foul-smelling teeth, scarred by pox, crippled by headaches and plagued by bouts of depression. Elizabeth's cosmetics were dangerous. The Earl of Essex infamously burst into the Queen's chamber before she was dressed or made up. He was so shocked at her haggard appearance, he joked about her crooked carcass to his friends. Upon hearing this, Elizabeth chopped off his head. Although, to be fair, he did start a rebellion against her as well in 1601. Due to his failure in Ireland and his attempted rebellion to usurp the throne in 1601, Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, was arrested. The Queen's once fondness saved him from being hung, drawn and quartered. Instead, he was beheaded. Both Devereux's mother, Latisse Knowles, and sister, Penelope Rich, appealed for his freedom. But Penelope is said to have written such an arrogant letter that it ruined the appeal to the Queen. Elizabeth expected Robert to plead for his life, but he didn't, and so she signed the death warrant. On the 25th of February 1601, Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, was beheaded in the confines of the Tower of London and buried there in the Church of St Peter ad Vincula. At his own request, Essex had a private execution. On the scaffold, he swore he had never wanted the Queen's death, or intended to lead a coup. 1601 is also the year Elizabeth gives her golden speech to Parliament. There is no jewel, be it of never so high a price, which I set before this jewel. I mean your love. Until Henry VIII broke from Rome, Parliament had been an occasional event. Elizabeth had planned to keep it that way. 
However, tensions grew as the Queen's debts started mounting. Thanks to the war in Ulster, Elizabeth treated her Parliament to a golden speech, thanking them for their love of her, and she assuring her love to them, which they all bought and she was forgiven. High taxes, bad harvests, unemployment, stagnant wages, inflation and crime created discontent, and Elizabeth's popularity waned. Her golden speech had temporarily renewed her popularity. On the 25th of February 1603, Elizabeth's close friend and cousin Catherine Carey, Countess of Nottingham, died at Arundel House. This came as a blow to Elizabeth. Catherine had held the post of Lady of the Bedchamber to Elizabeth I until her death, dying only a few weeks before the Queen herself. Elizabeth paid the expenses of the funeral for her cousin. After 46 years on the throne, Queen Elizabeth I died on the 24th of March 1603 at Richmond Palace. All of Elizabeth's leading councillors and courtiers were agreed at this point that King James VI for Scotland was the rightful heir to the English throne. I mean, not true, but whatever. Robert Cecil had been in secret communication with King James for years, yet Elizabeth herself had never come out and said James was her successor. Now, as she lay dying on her cushions in front of a fire, her counsellors tried for the last time to get an answer from her. Troubled me no more. Who else but my cousin Scotland? It was at last definite. Her counsellors were ready. It was important that James received the news and came to London as quickly as possible to forestall a Catholic coup. Seven strong, fast horses were ready at 50 mile intervals up the Great North Road. Sir Robert Carey, Elizabeth's cousin, dressed for a long, cold ride, sat astride his own horse beneath the window for the Queen's withdrawing room. In the early hours of the morning, his sister Lady Philadelphia Scrope, also Elizabeth's cousin and her lady-in-waiting, appeared at the Queen's bedroom window and silently dropped the sapphire ring from Elizabeth's finger down to him. The Queen had drawn her last breath. Sir Robert caught the ring and was off riding to Scotland. He covered the 400 miles to Edinburgh in three days. James, King of Scots, was now James, the first of England. Many people speculate this part of the story to be a myth. I have a feeling it might be, but I can say I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the theatrical side of this. Queen Elizabeth's funeral was on the 28th of April, 1603, and she was buried at Westminster Abbey with her sister, Queen Mary I, and they share a tomb probably against both of their wishes. Chronicler John Stowe reported at her funeral, There was such a great general sighing, groaning and weeping, as the like hath not seen or known in the memory of man. The lead coffin containing the Queen's body was drawn by four horses decked in black. Covered in purple velvet, there was a life-size effigy on it of the Queen, in her robes of state and royal crown. Six earls carried a canopy to protect the coffin. Then came the Queen's master of horse, leading her favourite palfrey. Many people wept when they saw the familiar horse without its rider. Next, dressed in black, came the chief mourners, led by the Marchioness of Northampton, Helena Snakenborg, slash Parr, Helena Parr. All the ladies of the court and many peeresses of the realms walked behind the coffin, through the streets to Westminster Abbey. Behind them walked 260 poor women, four abreast. It was rumoured that Arbella Stewart, or Arabella Stewart, depending on which version you prefer, was supposed to be the chief mourner. However, she refused to undertake the role and King James had not yet arrived in London. Hence why Helena Parr did it. And I'd like to end this episode on John Stowe's full eyewitness account. Westminster was surcharged with multitudes of all sorts of people in the streets. Houses, windows, leads and gutters that came to see the funeral. And when they beheld her statue lying upon the coffin, there was such a general sighing, groaning and weeping, as the like hath not been seen or known in the memory of man. 
neither doth any history mention any people, time or state to make like lamentation for the death of their sovereign. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. If you'd like to watch another of my videos, then may I suggest my video on Elizabeth's parents, King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn? Or what about her predecessor to the throne, Queen Mary I? At this point, I have no idea what we will be exploring next time as I haven't decided. But until then, have a wonderful day.